Hello, everyone. Okay. I, I am well, Alex Lim, Hang on, your host, and welcome to Author Story, the home of authors and stories that matter. This episode's featured guest is Maria Espinosa, who is the author of this episode's featured book, Suburban Souls. So, Maria, welcome to Author Story. Thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you, Alex. It's a real pleasure. All right, great. And yes, I'd love to talk about my new novel. <laughs> great. So before that, I'd like to get along a little bit into your background, you know, so our listeners can get a feel of who you are. So you have a body of literary work, which is somewhat varied, like you've got two books on poetry, you've translated uh, George Sands' Layla, and you have articles and short stories which appear in publications, a lot of publications like the, the Magnolia Review. Uh, was doing this, you know, writing, was this essentially something you have always wanted to do? Yes. Also, I've published five novels. Right. And two of them have won awards. Writing is something I think I had to do. I didn't really want to be a writer, but somehow mm -hmm. that was a very strong force impelling me towards what I would be doing. Right. And uh, have you been writing like from the start since as a child or, you know, were you just sort of like, um, <coughs> excuse me, did this just come along when you were when you're older? Well, I remember the first poem I wrote was about oh. snow. It rarely snowed where we lived in Long Island. And nice. I thought it was so beautiful. I wrote a poem about it. And then I don't remember writing anything except for school until mm -hmm. later when I began writing in my diary. Mm -hmm. And that became very necessary for me, for my psychological health, you might say, to be able to write thoughts down that I couldn't speak to anybody right. or that nobody would understand. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so so the, it, this essentially started out as you journaling uh, your life then more than anything else. Yes, especially when I was in college. I was so full of thoughts and so disturbed. I just wrote and wrote and wrote to keep sane, essentially. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and when did this shift happen, like from writing for yourself to, uh, you know, essentially writing things that other people would want to read? I think it started when I was about 17 and I would okay. write little stories to share with friends and then it bloomed outwards. Mm -hmm. Right. Now there's a, there's a big, you know, there's a big step between uh, being an unpublished author. I mean, essentially you write and maybe for just your friends and family to becoming a published author, one where your books can reach, you know, the mass market. Uh, what made you decide to essentially get your writing out there, get it beyond friends and family? Well, it began with writing poems. Uh -huh. And my former husband, Mario, encouraged me to get them published. They were self-published. Mm -hmm. They're still on, the, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. I think there's a couple of rare copies that were in the Berkeley Library. I found, I was quite surprised to find them there, these tiny little books. Right. And, but I wanted to write much more, more than I could put into poems. Mm -hmm. So I began writing and I wrote for a long time. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard to find a publisher. The first mm -hmm. novel I published was with a cooperative press that I mm -hmm. formed with two other women. By the time the novel appeared, we were all enemies with each other. It was really <laughs> awful. But the okay. novel came out. And then a few years later, it got picked up by Arte Publico Press, uh -huh. <clears throat> which is a, a very good Hispanic American press. Mm -hmm. They didn't know I was an American Jew with right. Polish German background because right. I had my husband's Spanish name. Mm -hmm. but they soon found out because that was what I wrote about so much. But they went ahead and published my first book, Longing. Mm -hmm. And then they published the second, Dark Plums. Mm -hmm. Dark Plums was actually the first one they published. And then Longing, the second one, won an American Book Award. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, uh, over the course of time, I mean, I'm sure you've honed your craft. I'm sure you've developed your craft as a writer. 
and also as a storyteller what were some of the things that you learned along the way to you know to improve yourself to improve your craft a good question huge question i think as woody allen said the first thing is just get you know be on the seat of your writing chair and write mm -hmm. do it mm -hmm. no matter how afraid you are no matter how lazy you feel um, if you want to write just write and read read widely read and read and read to what you glean what you get from other writers right. aside from enjoyment is you learn so much and i think discipline again having a schedule mm -hmm. which i'm no person to boast about because I'm not very good at keeping a schedule but I keep okay. trying <laughs> <laughs> and it works I mean you've got all your works out uh, right out in the public right now all these works yes right. <clears throat> okay cool it gets harder as I get older to keep a schedule mm -hmm. but I realize I've gotten quite lazy and I've got to push myself in fact it was very good for me to get up this morning and have to be ready to talk with you at seven o'clock in the morning it got me going and i realized hey i could do this every day <laughs> all right okay now the, the point i'd like to bring up here is that you're you're 81 right now and um uh, i and uh you know uh so it occurs to me that um uh, you're correct me if i'm wrong but it occurs to me that you're a bit of a late bloomer uh when it comes to writing you know uh bringing your writing out into the public is this correct um, could you repeat that, please? I'm not quite clear what you just no, said. Because uh, you're you're 81 years old right now, correct? 82. Just turned 82. 82. Okay. Well, well. Hey, happy birthday, belated happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it occurs to me that you know you were kind of because of your age, you, you're a bit of a late bloomer when it came to writing for you know bringing your works out to the public. Is this correct? Yeah, I didn't get my first novel published until i was in my 40s yeah uh -huh. okay because because that's interesting because a lot of folks who write you know they usually start bringing out their books in their 20s and their 30s um so so uh you know this this uh wanting to bring to to bring a book out i mean i i presume that you were you know you were influenced by your life uh how much of what you write is influenced by what goes on in your life as well as what happened in your life. Well, I'd say my first two novels are semi-autobiographical. The first mm -hmm. one, Dark Plums, is about a prostitute. I was never a prostitute, mm -hmm. but the emotions that the character goes through mm -hmm were very much my emotions. And that was a very strange novel, Narc Plums, because in the middle of it, totally unexpected, an old Jewish man, a survivor of the Holocaust, suddenly appeared and took over the novel and became one of the main characters. Mm -hmm. And that was very, very strange because after I had completed this novel, I met my second husband, mm -hmm who was 15 years older than me, not that much older, but older, a German Holocaust survivor, uh -huh. and very much like the man I had just written about. Uh -huh. I showed the manuscript to my, not, not my neighbor, and she mm -hmm. said, hey, Maria, you know, you've just written about the man you just met, uh -huh. but I'd written about it as though I almost foresaw this in the future or somehow magnetized it or got magnetized by him in some way it was very strange wow okay that never happened to me before that a character just suddenly appeared out of nowhere and said here i am write yeah. about me okay it's the most interesting experience and uh yeah yeah go ahead okay so um writing you know you you started out with journaling we'll get to your book in a couple of minutes but you started out yeah. journaling so um i know when i i myself journal on occasion and i found that you know i i realize a few things you know read when i read back in those entries that i didn't notice at the time that i was journaling uh some of these things mm -hmm. are like you know they sometimes help me understand other people has writing not just journaling but 
but also writing has this enabled you to understand others you know how how others work other people work very much in fact i think that's one of the motives of why i write is to mm -hmm. understand other people mm -hmm. because in writing about a character i have to imagine myself in their body in their mind uh -huh. and so of course it develops compassion it develops empathy it comes up develops understanding. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, I write to learn about myself or learn about other people around me who've had a strong effect on me. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned something else that you, you, uh, by writing, you also come to, uh, you know, you come to understand yourself. How much of um, writing has influenced you to become the person that you are now? That's an interesting question, too, because there was always a sense that I had to write. I think I mm -hmm. had that first ses sensation when I was in high school. I was a sophomore. Right. And I had a rather grim image of a lot of maroon, hardbound books and some image saying, this is it, you're meant to write. And I didn't want to. That was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. But I somehow felt this was what I was on earth to do. Mm -hmm. And again, I began writing. Mm -hmm. And I think the question is, what did I start learning? Mm -hmm. as, I, as I write, as I look back, I see differences, a lot of differences over the years mm -hmm. in what I write about. Uh -huh. So yes, it's been very much a tool of learning who I am. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would be nearly as aware if I didn't keep on writing. I see. And okay, given all that, do you think you're still learning something? I mean, even even at the age you are now? Oh, even at my age, that's a <laughs> oh, despairing question. At this point, I think if I live long enough, because I have so much that I want to write. Wow. Well, I have three novels that I have dra rough drafts of. Wow. I have two more that are you know, very, very rough drafts. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then the bit, the next project I want to do, which is unlike anything I've done before, uh -huh. is a nonfiction book about homelessness in Albuquerque. In fact, I even know exactly uh -huh. how I want to do it with perhaps one or two pages on each person right. with a photograph of this person that I'm interviewing. You know, perhaps 20 people and uh -huh. talk about who they are, what uh -huh. were their dreams, what were their hopes, who were they before they became homeless. Wow. And I would like to get this really into government hands, people right. who legislate, who who have are so much partly responsible for the whole situation that we're in with so many homeless. How is it in the, in Manila? Because I know here we have many. Oh well, well here in Manila, I mean, there's uh, we're 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 a developing nation, so there's still a lot of poverty on, on here, and I mean, there are lots of you know there are lots there's also homelessness as well. Yeah, yeah, so. and I would thought thought that in Manila there was perhaps a more supportive family network, so there might be fewer homeless because people could crash with their families more easily. Is that true or not? Well, that's that's general. That's I, I wouldn't know the f exact figures, but I would say, given the strong familial bonds around here, yes, I, I would say that that is likely to be true. Yeah. My brother Lee Kronbeck also lives in the Philippines, uh -huh. in a mountain village south of Manila, and he's a jazz musician. Uh -huh. He's written played some wonderful music it's on YouTube and you can mm -hmm. find it under his name Lee Kronbeck Lee Kronbeck that's L-E-E -E, and the last name is C-R-O-N B-A-C-H Lee mm -hmm. Kronbeck mm -hmm. look for his music it'll really blow your mind he's he's a wonderful wonderful musician all right okay so Definitely, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm definitely gonna check that out. I kind of like jazz myself, so yeah, that'll be that'll be something I look forward to. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. And he's also had a very interesting life. Mm, I'm sure. I'm sure. And his music is is wonderful. Right. 
Yeah. Okay, got that. And and it's it's surprising to me that I mean at your age, you're still thinking of writing three novels and a nonfiction book. I mean, it seems that you're at an age where a lot of folks would just sit back, you know, and watch TV and take it easy, but you are still a font of creativity, and I find that pretty amazing. Well, I, you know, I sometimes wish I could just kick back, and what I'd like to do is take a painting class, take up painting, take up sculptor, mm-hmm. you know, things that I've not really developed. My father was a sculptor, and yet... I see. There's always something pushing me on saying, this is, you know, you've got to do this. This is undone and you've got to do it. Mm-hmm. Almost like a bird building its nest or a mm-hmm. spider spinning its web to get a little bit macabre. Right. But, this, you know, this feeling of something, this is just what I'm meant to be doing. Nice. Nice. Okay. So at this point, I think, well, how much longer am I going to live? Well, right. I have to live long enough to get this stuff out. And then I have to get my financial papers in order so that my daughter doesn't get disinherited. (laughs) (laughs) So there's the passion and there's also the the practical element to it, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, Cool. Okay, so um, on to the book. Um, Suburban Souls, this is your fifth novel. No, it, yeah, it is my fifth, fifth novel. It's, it's not your fifth book, but it is your fifth novel, okay? It's a story about a Jewish couple in the 1970s. They're facing challenges stemming from their past. Can you just give us a thumbnail sketch of what the story is all about? Well, a German-Jewish couple who've barely escaped the Holocaust, they fled Germany as children, mm-hmm are still haunted by it. Mm-hmm. You know, their families perished. They realized that the whole culture was out to kill them. And that does something to a person when you feel that you're among a civilization that would just like to kill you. It, 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 it comes, it seeps into your spirit right. in varying degrees in different people. Mm-hmm. But in addition to that, they both had very how you'd say dysfunctional, difficult families, especially Mm -hmm. the woman whose name is Mm -hmm. Gerda. And she had really quite abusive, Mm -hmm. emotionally abusive parents, Mm -hmm. actually guardians because her parents had vanished. Right. So she's an extremely disturbed woman and she marries Saul Mm -hmm. who she thinks is going to be her savior. Mm -hmm. And he's terrified of emotion. Mm He really reacts by withdrawing into himself, and he's a scientist, so he goes and takes refuge in his work as right, a laboratory. Right. And she is stuck at home with three little children uh-huh. in a suburb, and the suburb itself becomes a character because it's an isolating kind of place. Mm-hmm. You're alone with your children and your wonderful appliances, but there's no one next door to run to. There's no neighbors you can sit down and gossip with there's Uh nothing there's no community her guardians are far away off in chicago and she's in california and so the whole setup of being at home with the little children and not having any kind of Mm. communal or family Mm -hmm. support Mm -hmm. just makes everything worse for her while right. he can go to his work and his office and his right. friends at work right. she doesn't have that okay. she has friends but they're all driving distances away right right and also i would say the spirit of the time mm-hmm. is a character it was a, the 70s were a time of great sense of liberation we're throwing off the past we're exploring mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it was the 60s carried on into the 70s. Right. People were experimenting with psychedelic drugs, mm-hmm. with open marriages, mm-hmm. with communes, all kinds of things that were fairly new at the time. Mm-hmm. So that whole culture was also influencing them. Right. She was less affected by it than Saul, mm-hmm. who began seeing a psychic. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. a woman who called herself psychic mm -hmm. and who called herself a healer, a mm -hmm. Danish woman who he eventually has an affair with. Mm -hmm. She in turn goes from the little suburban town that she's in into San Francisco mm -hmm. to North Beach to a famous bookstore, that famous bookstore with the name escapes me, but Laura's Ferlinghetti owned it. Mm -hmm. And there she stalks a German stranger, a man who she believes could be her long lost father. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and meanwhile, she's been blowing up her children, very much disturbing the oldest daughter. And the oldest daughter finally runs off to a commune in the Santa Cruz Mountains. All right. Okay. All right. You know, so let's not tell the entire story. Let's let let's let the folks you know read your book and find out what's going on but so this 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 book from what you to told me there's there are a lot of themes explored in here i mean there's isolation and then there's you know uh how do you put this not getting along well with uh their parents or with your children and there's i guess the the fear of the past as well um what what made you decide to write something about all these? Well, I've known quite a few Holocaust survivors, some very well. Mm -hmm. And I know how the past affects them. And I also know about dysfunctional marriages mm -hmm. where you're all alone all day and you try to connect with your husband and he's just not there for you. Right. It also could be the same for a man with his wife. She's not there for you. Right. So you're each feeling unheard, unseen, unvalidated by the other. Mm -hmm. And you, and these these essentially became your your inspiration, I suppose, for for writing. Yeah, for and a, they're a mix of characters. They're not one character. They're sort of a meld of different characters that I created into one. Mm -hmm. Each person. Right. Okay. So, so these characters, then, they're like, um, as you may possibly mentioned, they're like um, amalgamations, like composites of people you actually know. Is this correct? Yeah. Very much. Wow. Okay. Okay. And and plus my own emotions, because you always put yourself into a story. Right. I mean, whatever you're writing about, even if you're writing about something in outer space right. or insects, you're writing your own emotions into it. Right. Okay, and and this is interesting. And I'm just I'm just curious, is this the kind of book you figured you'd be writing when you started out writing? No, I didn't. I really <laughs> didn't have any idea what I'd be writing. Okay, all right, interesting. So you know, this is wow. I mean, congratulations on your development as a as a writer. Then, thank you. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, yeah. So you know. Um, can, all right, so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So they say experience is the best teacher. So if you could go back in time and tell your younger self anything, anything at all, what would it be? Oh, you know, the old adage, if youth would and age could, if only I had had the self-confidence and the nurturing of myself now mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. I if I only had it in my 20s that I right. have I think now I'm much more stable and more accepting of who I am more mm -hmm. accepting of other people in other words I've grown up <laughs> <laughs> but right. I wish I'd reached the same point when I was a lot younger it would have saved me a lot of heartache <laughs> well you wouldn't have become the person you are now without without all those experiences so you know that's that's something I suppose it was a hard path. It hasn't been an easy life until recently. It's right. become much smoother. Right. Okay. So um, I just have one one question. I'm really been curious about. Why do you call yourself Maria Espinosa when when you say oh, that's your a Polish good question. Youth? Yeah. Well, I was born Paula Kronbeck, mm -hmm. and I never felt at home somehow with that. Maybe it was because uh -huh. of the way my mother spoke Paula was, it was not spoken with love. It was spoken with a kind of, Paula, you've done something wrong. I had this uh -huh. feeling of somehow it didn't work. Mm -hmm. 
although it's very much by name. Mm -hmm. And then I married somebody named Espinosa. Okay. And then I had always wanted to be Maria for some reason. I don't know why uh -huh, it was some uh -huh. foolish teenage thing, but I just liked that name. Mm -hmm. So one day in 1966, mm -hmm. I just decided that I would call myself Maria. So I went to the Motor Vehicle Bureau in, California, in San Rafael, California, and just added it to my driver's license. Mm -hmm. And then I published a few things under the name Paula Espinosa, and for some mm -hmm. reason I decided to go with Maria. I so I've become that. So I've become a false Chicano, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, really what's important is all the stories you bring out, you know, what you write. So, uh, you know, that's, as far as I'm concerned, a name's just a name. Yeah, I know, but it's a lot. It, yeah. I've never felt comfortable with it. I've never really felt okay with this. Uh -huh. So I keep writing, wanting to think, our oh, next book will be published by Paula Cronbeck mm -hmm. or written by Paula Cronbeck. Mm -hmm. And somehow, I don't know why, it just doesn't work. It I just see. doesn't. <clears throat> All right, cool, okay. Okay, so, uh, so. Oh, I could say more on that. Go ahead, go ahead, please. While I'm Jewish, I also have a very strong Catholic sense, almost a sense in my body. So I feel uh -huh. half Catholic and half Jewish. Okay. Because I know that my ancestors intermarried in Spain. And when I was pregnant, I was living in Paris with Mario Espinosa. Mm -hmm. And every morning I would go to this very old, beautiful Catholic church and pray. Mm -hmm in front of a beautiful wooden statue of the Virgin. Mm -hmm. So I felt very much at home with that somehow. Mm -hmm. I see. And when I felt about, there was no Jewish rabbi I could go to at that time who would give me the kind of spiritual sense that I felt in that church. Uh-huh, okay. All right, interesting, interesting, very interesting influence. But at the same time, all the whole the whole Jewish bloodline has appeared in every single one of my novels. Right. And again, I'm held to write about it. Right. Okay. Well, that's a very interesting, you know, it's a very interesting story. And I must say the, the rationale makes sense. Yeah, okay. these are good questions. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I, I've only got one more question since we're winding down the interview. Are there any last words of wisdom you'd like to share to inspire our listeners? You know, it could be anything. I mean, you're 82, so I'm sure you've got a lot of wisdom right there. <laughs> so, you know, any, any words of wisdom you'd like to share, you know? Oh, I would just say, believe, go with your gut, go with your instincts, believe in yourself. Okay. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Okay, everyone, so take note of that. Go with your gut. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and there was something that I remember that Kamala Harris said her mother said to me, and she said, uh -huh. Kamala, don't let people tell them who you are. You tell them who you are. You tell them uh -huh. who you are. And that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And and you, you carry it out, I mean, with Maria Espinosa instead of your, instead of your birth name. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, cool. Okay then, so in closing, our guest is Maria Espinosa. Her book, her fifth novel, is Suburban Souls. You can find it on Amazon. So Maria, thank you very much for being an author story. It was a lot of fun being able to speak with you today. Well, thank you, Alex. It was a great honor to be with you, a great pleasure. Thank you very much. You're welcome, you're welcome. So everyone, check out Suburban Souls. Also, go right ahead and hit that subscribe button as a heads up on all the people and stories we have on this channel. So catch you guys next time on Author Story, the home of authors and people with stories that matter.